It's with great pleasure that I am able to spend some time with a very special friend of ours, a man who works for ARM. His name is James Bruce, and he's the head mobile strategist for ARM. And here we are at Mobile World Congress from Barcelona, and we're going to ask some tough questions. Okay, not so tough, but actually, let's just talk about ARM as a company, and let's just talk about how things have led up to now. So, I mean, as you know, ARM is about uh, 23 years old, yes. and really our focus, rather than being a processor company, we came up with this unique business model where we actually license the processor to other chip companies. And what this means is that you have great companies like Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Samsung, Broadcom, I could keep on going, there's 200 of them. And it really allows them to innovate. They can use a standards-based core with access to a great ecosystem such as Android. But then it allows them to do their own unique SOCs. And I think the really exciting thing from the perspective of consumers, perspective of people who really care about their gadgets, is that you end up with devices that are unique, that are different, rather than just taking one SOC and everyone doing different plastics around it. What happens is that you see different solutions, different products coming out of that, and at different price points. And I think down here we've got some great examples. So the first one we have is a tablet uh, from China. This is a quad-core Cortex-A7 uh, from Allwinner. It has a IPS screen running at um, 2K resolution. And a retina display. Retina display, yeah. And this, um, as I mentioned, had a $250 price point and has, for the price point and the fact that it's just using Cortex-A7, has a great user experience. Wow. Half the price of an iPad with the same display. That's right, yeah. And this actually comes into our next device here, which I really like. And this is the um, based around Quad A7. And it's using the uh, MediaTek part. And it's got a very nice display. It's got a great user interface, very fluid. And this is also coming up, at, coming into the market at a very sort of mid-level price point. So there's a number of users where they're not lucky, like for example, we are in the US where handsets are heavily subsidized, where they want a great user experience, but perhaps don't want to spend $600. Of course. And devices like this are great. Price, and, price point on this one, James? Um, price point for that is, um, hasn't quite come to market, but I would expect it to be around that sort of $250, $300. So that mid You mentioned that this one was almost e egregiously inexpensive. That's right. So th um, this particular one sells for $70 unsubsidized. $70. But if you want to go lower, there's actually another handset based around the same chipset, a Spreadtrum A5. Um, selling for $48 unsubsidized in China. Yes. And that really shows the differences that you're getting, the sort of scale of solutions. And then, if you're like me, if you're a sort of gadget geek and want the sort of ultimate and, and greatest... And I think you are, James. Oh, of course, I wouldn't <laughs> be doing this job otherwise. Yes. Then what we've got here is a demonstration wow. of the Exynos 5 Octa showing our big little... This is the Exynos 5 Octa? Yep. Can you speak a little bit about this for us? Absolutely. So it has eight cores, but rather than eight cores being the same size, it's actually four little cores and four big ones. And the reason is, is a lot of tasks actually don't need that high performance. No. So you run on the little cores, and then when you need the performance, it will just switch over to the big cores when needed, as demonstrated here, go back to the littles. So you actually get the best of both worlds. You get this very high battery efficiency and very high performance. So if you look at things like the Quad Cortex A15 devices, if you look at benchmarks like Geekbench, they're actually approaching uh, benchmarks that you see in a typical laptop in someone's home today. Truly. So it's going to be really exciting when products like this get into your hands. For the introduction, there's been a lot of speculation you know, about the Octa. Yeah, and a lot of consumers, uh, at least in our commenting and on our forums and everything, they said, "When is when are the cores going to stop?" And in reality, are we actually going to see octa core in 2013? So you in devices. So you're going to see octa core, but you've got to remember this is not octa core like quad core. Not in the conventional sense. We That's know. We yeah. can understand. Yeah. I think our our readers and our viewers at Android 30 are certainly savvy yeah. enough to appreciate the difference between a traditional echo processor and a big little. Yeah. It's, it's two architectures working simultaneously. 
you know? That's right. Yeah. And so I think really you're going to see no increase in the number of the same cores, but what you're going to see is actually people using more cores to actually deliver greater performance. Yes or greater power efficiency. And the next step is really GP, GPU compute. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm sure a lot of your readers have the Nexus 10, which has our Mali T604. It's a very powerful SOC. Exactly. And that actually has, the Mali T604 has been used now for things like image processing, mm -hmm. image editing, video editing. And so you're going to see this trend of more and more cores because it really allows, to, allows you to have the right core for the job at hand. Interesting. Can you explain to me just briefly why Apple with their iPad, and I know you enjoy a special relationship ARM does with Apple, why they're able to push out so much performance, yet 512 megabytes of RAM and low clock frequencies, and what I view as previous generation reference instruction sets. So, I mean, obviously, um, I can't comment on Apple directly, I but I think you've really got to look at um, you know, it's very much when you look at any product like this, yes. from Firefox OS to yes. um, other products such as Windows Phone to Android, it's very dependent upon the OS, how it's designed, Truly, yes. and how much That's memory you use. Yeah. So it's um, very dependent upon just the fundamental OS and what you're doing with it. Mm. Uh, and obviously the language that is coded in, you know, it's very different. You know. Android being Java based, uh, it presents certain, you know, architectural challenges, you know, in terms of efficiency, I think. Uh, I mean, Android's a great OS, and no yeah, <laughs> and, but also it's a very powerful OS with yeah. a lot of multitasking. Exactly. And I think that's uh, one of the great things about Android. You've got great handsets like the Note 2, um, other handsets with two gigabytes, and the real um, multitasking environments. And I'm sure you've seen the videos in the web where Note 2's been used as sort of desktop replacements. I have a Note 2, and it, yeah. it's changed my life. Yeah. It's uh, extremely productive, you know? And I think the exciting thing is that you're going to see much more powerful handsets coming out this year. Wow. So as, a, you know, as your readership is sort of true sort of Android we are. Um, fans, you're going to have some really exciting devices, be it smartphones or tablets in your hands. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is Intel. And they're trying to play a lot of catch up. In the x86, you know, just in terms of the economy of scale, yeah, they've killed it and they're very profitable. But x86 processors are diminishing year after year, ARM in the server space, and the TDPW versus you know the TDPW that Intel's able to produce. So I, I think what people have got to keep in mind is that fundamentally, if you look at, uh, let's say, the Atom processor in sure. a Medfield handset okay. versus one Cortex-A9, yeah. performance-wise, they're roughly the same. They deliver the same benchmarks. You can always find one benchmark that makes the other guys look uh, better and vice versa. They love that. But the key thing is, is that the Cortex-A9 is almost four times smaller than the Atom. Yeah. And what that means is, is that fundamentally your SOCs are cheaper, fundamentally um, you're more power efficient. And I think the other great thing is that really it's about buying cool devices. And if you look at what x86 has done, it's brought nothing new to the market. They have brought not for a long time. Not any new super phones. And if you look at all the cool devices, even you know at great price points or great performance, it's it's arm based because we really allow people to innovate. Well, and you have a, a lot of active relationships with a lot of very innovative and forward-thinking companies. So, tell me this: ten years from now, James, will we have a device that perhaps is this size that can really just be our everything? Or is it coming sooner than that? It's coming much sooner. So I think you're really looking at the point in, let's say, two years. Two. Two years where it will have, um, really, if you look at the Exynos 5 Octa and other parts such as the Tegra 4, they're almost at laptop performance Truly, this yeah. year. So 2014, 2015, um, really the only limit is the size of your screen. And if you plug in to wirelessly connect to monitors, Absolutely. Bluetooth, keyboard, mouse, then it can replace your desktop laptop. And the last question that I'll ask you, sir, is, you know, the, the <laughs> it's really incredible, the IP instruction sets that you're revealing and that you're working with partners on actively improving everything. Yeah. But everything's improving. People can argue 80 to 140 to 200% per year in terms of, you know, the, the performance. Yeah. 
but battery life is only increasing at 5% per year. So what can we do in terms of that regard? So I think there's uh, two things to keep in mind. Certainly uh, what you're seeing is we're looking at technologies like Big Little, which we've talked about, GPU compute, all there to improve efficiency. Yeah. I'm going to cheat and uh, whip this little... out. So I what like it, that's beautiful. So what we've got here is a 14 nanometer test wafer 14. from 14 nanometer wow. FinFET on SOI. TSMC? Uh, no, actually IBM. Wow. Oh, yeah. they're scary. So really advanced technology that helps on the power tool as well. Yeah. And it's really... That's incredible. But I think the other critical thing to keep in mind is if you look, let's say, uh, 10 years ago when you had that wonderful Nokia S40 handset, yeah. unless you were a snake addict, it was very hard to use the battery through the day because you just couldn't do much with it. You could but text, make a phone. very different now, James. Make a phone call. And now you just do so much on your phone because it's very much your primary compute device. But certainly, as you look at new screen technologies, technologies like Big Little, the other stuff that our partners are doing, your battery life is going to get better. Galaxy S4 Octo-Core? I would let Samson answer that one. You're no fun. <laughs> just joking. Thank you so much for your time, All sir. Right. OK, great. I, I, it's I really, great uh, it's an honor. You great know. meeting you. Yeah, you. You as well, James. All right, thanks so much. Yep. Android Authority here live from Mobile World Congress. Hearing straight from the man himself, it's a real pleasure and an honor. I'm kind of having nerd struck right now, and we'll stay <laughs> in touch. Be the other way. No, <laughs> you know we're here for you guys, delivering the freshest, finest Android news every day. Thank you very much.